Institute with the theme of urban color lines because we wish to foreground the ways in which our cities manifest inequalities. And we want to make the point that these inequalities have been formed and maintained through long histories of exclusion. Over a century ago, the prominent social thinker W.E.B. Du Bois argued that the problem of the 20th century was the problem of the color line. So is it in the 21st century when subordinated peoples and marginalized communities face floor closure, eviction, and even outright banishment from global cities. It is especially important and poignant for us to have this event this evening here at the Japanese American National Museum because this history of forced removal and internment is not over. At a time of resurgent white supremacy here in the United States, and massive and accelerated displacement of peoples around the world, we are reminded of the ways in which race, class, gender, ethnicity, and nationality can be mobilized for hate, profit, and domination. But we are gathered here this evening to draw inspiration in two ways. First, the program is organized around the work of poor people's movements, the ways in which they challenge unequal cities, and the ways in which they build globally interconnected democratic futures for us all. For the sake of brevity, I'm not going to describe the work of each of our speakers in any great detail. You will be hearing from them. But I want to note that each is a towering figure in struggles against urban displacement and much more. Ashraf Kasim of the Western Cape Anti-Eviction Campaign is here from South Africa. And he is perhaps the most articulate theorist of and strategist against neoliberalism that I have met. <laughs> Beat White of the LA Community Action Network has been my tutor ever since I arrived in the city. And he shows the way, like no other, for racial justice and community organizing. <laughs> Pat Hill of the Chicago Anti-Eviction Campaign has worked both within and against the system, as a police officer, as a teacher, and as an activist. Willie J.R. Fleming of the Chicago Anti-Eviction Campaign is indeed an embodiment of just righteousness, defending human rights from the south side of Chicago to the conference rooms of the United Nations. My co-moderator, Laura Polito, brilliantly illuminates the racial injustice and environmental injustice that lies at the very core of global Los Angeles, but also the ways in which poor communities fight such oppression. <laughs> but we also draw inspiration this evening in a second way, from a set of performances curated by Dan Fruit, my colleague at UCLA, a member of the Faculty Advisory Board of the Institute on Inequality and Democracy, and a founder of the organization 501C3 Arts. In working with Dan, I've been reminded of the power of art, affect, and representation to stir up our deep memories of pain and longing, to create in unexpected ways solidarity and reciprocity, to bring museums of history to life through narrative, art, and music. I'm reminded in particular of that beautiful essay by Audre Lorde that poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital necessity of our existence. Poetry is the way we help give name to the nameless so that it can be thought. This, I hope, will be our collective experience this evening. I now invite Dan Fruit to join me in welcoming you to this evening's program, Brown, Black, and Banished, Ending Urban Displacement in 21st Century Democracies. Dan. Thank you. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ananya. Thank you to our hosts here at Janum, and welcome everyone. It's a great honor this evening to celebrate with you the launch of this radical activist institute. I'm delighted that the institute is enjoining artists in the battle against urban banishment. As you know, artists are often found in the trenches alongside such esteemed scholars and activists as we will hear from tonight. Further, it is gratifying, a gratifying measure of our younger generation's commitment to social justice that all of tonight's performers are UCLA students, with the exception of one faculty member. Social action is intellectually and emotionally motivated. Tonight, we get a small taste of how storytelling and the arts can compel us to face injustice by adding layers of emotional complexity and human dimensionality. The first performance you will see is a reading of excerpts from an oral history of Kan Ching Matthews, her nine children, and her uncle, Arenio Opinaldo, who are, at this very moment, dealing with an eviction from their home in South Central LA. Tonight's reading is excerpted verbatim from oral history transcripts, but two years from now, we will be premiering a play based on Kan Ching and Arenio's story, and we are honored tonight by their presence here with us. Bernard Brown's dance, Champion, provokes us to contend with forces of racial banishment at the corporeal level. Bernard's research on racially restrictive covenants in Los Angeles, Little Tokyo, Lamert Park, and Westwood prompted him to choreograph a dance about claiming and taking space, drawing and breaking boundaries. I would like to draw your attention to a program change. Sandy Vasquez's dance and spoken word piece about development, gentrification, and displacement in her hood will not be seen tonight. It is ironic that Sandy sprained her foot a couple of days ago while dancing in a cipher, hip hop culture's circle of freestyling and radical inclusion. The cipher itself is a wildflower that grew out of blighted, disenfranchised communities in the South Bronx and here in Los Angeles. Of course, art has always taken root in the most marginalized communities as an expression of dignity, anger, and humanity. And so, with no further ado, I would like to thank you for joining us and for helping to launch this visionary institute. is our family house. Brighton Avenue and West 27th Street in South Central Los Angeles. My grandmother bought this when my mom was seven and my uncle was nine. He's now 75. I've lived here since I was three. This house has a lot of history. For instance, there's nobody who smokes, but from time to time, you can walk through and smell a cigar. There's only one person who smoked cigars, and that was my great-great-grandfather. My grandmother, we recognize her by the gardenias that she used to grow in the front yard. She used to put them in a little container filled with water, and when you'd walk through the hallways, it's all you would smell. My uncle is a retired school teacher and an activist. He fights for people's rights in homes and things like that. He's been an activist since he got custody of us. 
It was a tremendous step for him when my mom passed away. She had said, take care of my children. He never even really thought about having children. And for him to say, okay, I'm gonna take these three daughters and their children as well. And of course, I was a pain in the butt. So he had to deal with a crazy temper tantrum teenager and he did the best that he could. When I was raising these children, there were gangs, there were shootings on this block. I organized the community, got rid of two crack houses, got rid of the selling of marijuana. We got the conditional use permit because there used to be drug dealers and prostitutes out by the liquor stores. They foreclosed on the Brighton Avenue house. The deed had my uncle's name on it. I was paying two insurances on my house. I'd never had two insurances on my property. But once I got with American Servicing Company, which is part of Wells Fargo, I suddenly had two insurances. I called for like 18 months. I wanna know about these two insurances. I want to know why I'm paying an extra thousand dollars every January. And they would never return my call. And then finally, one lady said to me, it's your fault. You didn't keep after us. Right after that, a man came. And I guess at the time, my uncle was trying to modify the mortgage. And this man convinced my uncle to allow him to help him. Felix Santos came to my house. He was a mortgage broker. And he said, what a wonderful house you have. And because he was Filipino, and I'm part Filipino, I said, OK, this is my brother. And I said, I'm having trouble with American Servicing Company, because they won't answer my question. And I need a loan modification because I have to pay two insurances. And Felix says, for you to get a loan modification, you need to get behind on your mortgage. I had heard other banks say that, but I had never been behind. The number one thing, the banks want you to get a loan. In order, and in getting a loan, they can resell it to another bank, and another bank, and another bank. Well. The man was taking the money. He came every month to pick up the check from me. And the mortgage wasn't getting paid. He was stealing the money. I would say almost $200,000 in monthly payments. And so they foreclosed on the house. My house was worth $1.5 million. And I got nothing. The legal aid person said to me, I don't know how American Service and Company didn't know what Felix Santos was doing. Because he's done this to several other people. They should have known that. So I was set up. So now we're fighting for the property and for the rights of other people because Wells Fargo is continuously foreclosing on properties and leaving people homeless. And with him being an activist in tenants' rights, it really hit home when it happened to him. I trusted people too much. We went to court to stop the foreclosure, and the judge ruled against us. So we went back to court again, and the judge did not come out at all. We didn't get to tell our side of the story. She just denied us right offhand. So then, a couple of days later, we were served with a sheriff notice to vacate the property. We had to have the entire house cleaned out which is kind of hard to do 
being that the family has been in the house over 60 something years. Well, I got a house in Hemet, which is in Riverside County. So that's where I'm going. And wherever I go, my nine children go. They'll be able to exercise like they want to. They'll be able to walk up and down the street. They won't have to deal with the helicopters, the police sirens. Whereas being in LA, they've been confined to the house. Because of the environment here, you can't wear this color. You can't walk down the street doing this. When I'm in Hemet, I'm kind of forced to settle myself. And I'm able to actually think about what's going on, how I should process it, and what I need to do next. The house on Brighton Avenue, it has a lot of history. And for me, that history was not always comforting. Just a lot of, I don't know what the word is, disappointments. I kept asking God, why do I have to live in this house? What is the purpose for my being here? I do not like this house. I don't want nothing to do with this house. And it all became clear with him losing the house then I understood, okay, this is why I'm here. Because he doesn't have anyone to help him fight the battle. I think once I came to terms with it, I felt peace within myself. I loved that house. Throughout the whole thing, I was never able to cry until I walked away that night. I was alone. I cried all the way from LA to Hemet. I'm gonna get back my house. I hope that he gets it back, because that's what he wants. I would help maintain it. I would do whatever is needed to be done, but I won't live in it. Or else, I'm gonna get several million dollars, because I have all these children to think about. But if he doesn't get it back, I feel like this is his opportunity to live for him, and not have the burden of, I always have to take care of my daughters, I always have to take care of the next family member. For the moment, he just wants to get a hold of Felix Santos, an American servicing company, and Wells Fargo to make them pay for all the underhandedness. And I'm the kind of person, you don't mess me over that way. Yeah, he's still fighting. And he's not going to give up. Um, I thank you very much, Ananya. I want to use this opportunity, though, to thank Ananya for creating this vision. And we want to make sure that it is realized. So I want to play a part in this realization of this vision. Um, and I'm glad everybody came. <laughs> so thank you very much for everybody that came. Uh, what I want to share with you is how we started the, the Western Cape anti-eviction campaign. So it happened a long time ago, it's in 1999, and uh, it started at an eviction of a pensioner, and uh, the sheriff arrived with uh, 20 rand, okay, I, I don't know what you call 20 rand labor, but you know when you, when you get people from a corner, 
You pick them up, you give them a day job. So people, these guys used, used to get 20 rand a day. 20 rand is like one dollar in today's rates, right? So that's what they would be working for, carrying out furniture in people's houses. Nevertheless, um, just before that happened, I was, uh, I was employed, obviously. <laughs> I was the mainframe computer operator. And um, I was on my way to work, actually. And I also worked for a company called Typeface Media that um, was drafting the Constitution of South Africa. So we drafted, they drafted the 1994 Constitution of South Africa, as well as the final one in 1996. So uh, at the time I was doing desktop publishing, so I used to read the Constitution before it was published. Every day. <laughs> when I make a mistake, I have to read it again. So the Constitution was imprinted in my mind. And on the day when I went to stand on the corner, where the family lives, the Latifan family, the pensioner, his wife, and three children. Uh, I saw the sheriff approaching him. I went there immediately because I knew he couldn't read and he couldn't write. He only understood Afrikaans. He didn't understand English that the sheriff was speaking to. I asked him if he wanted my help. He said yes, because at the time he was in my small group of uh, adults who I was trying to. Uh, teach the alphabet, some math and simple mathematics, and so on. I asked him to put his hand in my pocket and tell the sheriff that I will now be him. And the sheriff didn't like that. So then I started to explain that according to the Constitution, because it was in my mind, it was in my brain, I knew exactly... I knew every word, every comma, because I put it there. <laughs> and I started to question, why is the Magistrate Court Act of 1944 being used to evict a pensioner? He didn't say, says, look, I'm doing my job. I'm just coming to do, the, do my job. That was not happening. Uh, myself and the family, by about five minutes after the confrontation, uh, there was about a hundred people outside the house already. And we decided there and then that he was not going to be evicted. Um, the sheriff then called the police. They arrived in vans. There was like more than probably 20 vans. They arrived to um, manage the eviction. So they were there for the protection of the sheriff. The community was not having that. So what, what happened on the day is, when they were carrying the furniture out, we were carrying it back in. <laughs> and then we had a confrontation that lasted, for me, it felt like a lifetime, because I was picked out from everybody and assaulted. Uh, I have some dog bites on my back and my arm. My mother got a heart attack because she tried to lay on me when they were assaulting me. And I was arrested together with my mother and four other community members. So we were taken to the local jail in Mitchell's Plain, like with about 10 vans. But that evening, in the cell uh, in Cape Town in South Africa, uh, when you go to the jail, that's another story. So I wasn't having a, not a, bad, a bad time because I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk. I was sitting on one side of my bum because all the rest was bruised and battered. They did not take me to a hospital. Uh, I lost my teeth. My teeth was kicked in. There's some pictures that surround that will show a policeman holding my hand and another one kicking my teeth in. I was thrown into the van, knocked my head, unconscious. I was unconscious about four times in that, that's why I said it lasted a lifetime. Um, the evening at the police station, while we were talking to other prisoners, we were, like, I just started to organize, like, I just started to talk to everybody, 
finding out who else is in the same situation at home uh, in the cell. So I was quite safe. Oh, and another guy that, uh, that was arrested with me, he's a gang member, he's a jail gang member, so I was protected. <laughs> um, but the evening of uh, the 16th of October, I was surprised, I was pleasantly surprised, because my community that I come from, they were in the corridors of the cell that I was in. They occupied the police station. There was like something like 7,000 people. And they demanded the release of the people that were arrested, including myself. They approached me in the cells and told me to please leave <laughs> because they cannot work in their offices. All the offices are occupied with people from my community. Right. And I refused to leave. I said, no, I was arrested. I'm appearing in court tomorrow. <laughs> they said, no, you have to leave. We, we got work to do. We need to do some work in this police station. I refused to leave unless the other five that was arrested with me was released first. They then came past my cell with each one they took out. And they were released. And eventually, I was released to the community. And that evening, we marched back to our community. And we put everybody that there were 17 families evicted that day. We put each family back into their house. And from that day, every day, we would put people back into their house. We would gather in the morning and look for people that was evicted. We would walk through the streets, literally, looking for people that was evicted. And this is the, the anti-fiction campaign was not formed at that time. Anyway, I think I should just carry on past that because I think my 10 minutes is going to be over. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to come back to a discussion. Okay. Yes. The thing is that from that day, nothing else happened. Evictions happened. Water cutoffs happened. Electricity cutoffs happened. And all we did is we reconnected the water. We reconnected the electricity. And we put people back into their homes. Eventually, so we attended the World Conference are the World Summit on Sustainable Development. Firstly, in, in Cape Town, we went into other communities. We first started in Taufosa, where I'm from, and then we went into our neighboring communities, which is Kailicha. I'm in Mitchell's Lane, Kailicha, predominantly um, African, which will be uh, Tosa or Zulu. Mm. And they have a place called Kailicha, which is called Home at Last. And they were being evicted. And we went into the community, we, ex we didn't explain anything, we showed them how to put people back into their cars. In Kailicha at this time, there was a lot of people evicted. There was more than 700 people evicted already. So we got a big truck. I see a lot of them on the, on the, in the, uh, on the freeway and all around. We got a big truck and we went to the place where people were right-sized to. The place was called Makarva. So people were right-sized into smaller units because the impression that was created that they cannot afford where they're living, they must get smaller units, which was one-room units. For families of six, for families of seven, it was one room. And nevertheless, and we put people back in. We, go, we, we took their stuff, put it on the truck, and moved the people back into the house. With the people that occupied the houses after the eviction, we kindly asked them to go back where they were coming from. Because they had homes, but they, this was extra homes or, you know, yeah. So, I wanted to still get to say so many things, but the time, I think, my 10 minutes is up. <laughs> so, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that the questions that you have will inform what happened next.
But um, I want to say something, but I also want you to say something. So all I want you to say is Awe Tu. Can somebody say that? <laughs> Awe Tu. Yes. So I'm going to say Amandla and you say Awe Tu. All together. Amandla! Awe Tu! Amandla! Awe Tu! Amandla! Awe Tu! Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Ashraf. JR. All right. I know you're not going to be seated. No, this is too much energy. But before I get started, I'm going to need a little energy. So like Ashcroft, I'm going to say something. I'm going to need you to say something. I'm going to say, we are the people. And you're, all right, Tucson. And you're going to say what? Then I'm going to say, we got a story. And you're going to say, to tell the whole wide world, and then this you're going to say, this, this is, is people's territory. territory. We are the people. What? We got a story what? to tell the whole what? wide world. This is people's territory. We are the people. What? We got a story what? to tell the whole wide world. This is people's territory. We are the people. What? We got a story. What? To tell the whole wide world. This is people's territory. This is the story I was told. So my name is J.R. Fleming. I'm the executive director and the co-founder of the Chicago anti-eviction campaign. You heard from the original founder, thank you, brother Ashraf, from Cape Town. And some might wonder how you get from Cape Town to Chicago. How do you get from Cabrini to the United Nations? So I was raised in public housing, a community that many would debate the facts. We'll argue with the institution from here to the end of time. As we debate whether it was 9,000 people in Cabrini Green, 14,000 people in Cabrini Green, or 25,000 people. Because in every community, you have an undocumented population. I was a part of that undocumented population, a population that consisted of 98% leaseholders being women of African descent. I was not always an activist. In fact, I was America's best capitalist in public housing. With 25,000 people, I figured I can sell them anything, right? <laughs> Until one day the buildings came down. My people displaced. I knew it was a problem because I knew the people of my community came from many tribes, like the continent of Africa, South America, Eastern Europe. Why you had different fashions of people, all living in one community. And here it is, our government, because they wanted to practice not ethnic cleansing like Slobodan Milosevic in Eastern Europe, not internal displacement like you'll see in Sudan, not forceful evictions, but they wanted to practice gentrification, thinking that we wasn't intelligent enough to compare our problems to the struggles of the world. We said no. This is not gentrification. Why, that's just a nice word. <laughs> this is urban and economic cleansing. Wherever you have a population of poor people with close proximity to metropolitan cities where businesses is conducted, tourist attractions, where you ever have you had poor people with a close proximity to universities who was trying to expand. Wherever you had a population of poor people with a close proximity to waterfront, they were instantly removed from land in the name of economic development, upward mobility, or hope six, as they say it in America. <laughs> Housing opportunities for people everywhere. So living in Cabrini Green, I was surrounded by some of the fiercest fighters in the history of mankind to me. Some of the fiercest women who would challenge our local, state, and federal government all the way to the United Nations. How dare they dream? that the United Nations would care about people in public housing in America. How dare they dream? But they dream. In fact, that's how I got in the movement. Well, I started off as an artist and a filmmaker making t-shirts for the organization Fighting for the Community because it was profitable, right? And then somehow they tricked me into the movement. As I began to come <laughs> around, I say, where are the black man? Where the brothers at? I see the white man trying to help us fight, fighting for us. I see all of the women in the community fight. Where are the brothers? She said, until you guys step up, there will be none. So I answered the challenge like I would any game, because I play sports, right, thinking, okay, I'm going to help them out for four quarters, like football, basketball, and the game going to be over. Being a student of history, I, I studied that 
Martin Luther King aspired for the United Nations to investigate the racial practices, the economic genocide in America. Malcolm X even talked about it. And here are these women in public housing, the least unfortunate, aspiring that the United Nations would come in to hear their complaint. Well, in 2004, they came in on an unofficial mission. Maloon Guattari, the special rapporteur on housing at the time. Now, this is an unofficial mission, so it never happened, right? Never got documented. In fact, it took almost four years for the UN to actually come in on an issue impacting a lot of folks, not just poor. An issue of racial discrimination, Islamophobia, because we was a country in turmoil around racial issues, be it to black folks or folks because of their religious belief. So the United Nations came in in 2008 on racial discrimination and said, you know what? We witnessed a lot of racism in America. But something unique happened in 2008. On November 4th, 2008, America elected its first African-American president. And everything the United Nations saw wiped away. Because who would say to America that they're racist when you got your first truly African-American president in the White House? So in 2009, the United Nations come back because of the foreclosure crisis, known as the economic crisis, because they learned, you know what? Americans are equal opportunity oppressors. They're taking houses from black folks, white folks, Latino folks, young folks, old folks. They didn't care. They only wanted the green. Something else happened in 2009. Why the special repertoire on housing is here, Raquel Ronan. She dismantled my belief that the UN was going to come into America and save us like Hotel Rwanda, right? <laughs> you know, the blue helmets and the brown truck. This was my vision. When the United Nations come in, I'm accident stage door left. I'm going to go back to filming and music. I'm going to be OK. I did my job. <laughs> so enough, Raquel came in and said, you know what? Until your voices are echoed, there will be no help from the United Nations. Lucky for us, Ashcroft came less than a week later. <laughs> Poor Americans, did you really think the United Nations was going to save you? <laughs> you have to save yourself, he says. And with that, he comes to Cabrini Green, one of the most notorious neighborhoods in America, and tells us we must do something ourselves. And I'm at an organization called the Coalition to Protect Public Housing. On one side, you have the redevelopment community of about 136 units. On this side, you have the 480 units that has not been redeveloped. And he said, how is the protection of public housing going? Not very well. So sensing that we needed to do something, we formed this campaign with the blessing of Brother Ashcroft. Did our very first blockade for Lenise Forrest and Cabrini Green. After Lenise Forrest blockade, we continued to fight not just for the homeless people, the public housing people, but not the homeowners. But well, white folks wanted to help now. You know, years before, they didn't care about the demolition of public housing. But when they lost their home and realized there was no Section 8, or there was a line for Section 8, and no more public housing, then everybody wanted to care about the human rights to housing. So organically, it was easy to build the momentum around a city that often known for being segregated, where you have white folks from the north side coming to the project. Man, they taking our houses, too. <laughs> they ain't just doing this to Negroes. How can we fight together? So with that challenge, we begin to fight. How many minutes? Two okay. is the time. Three. So with that challenge, we begin to fight. <laughs> 2011 come around. We run into a former resident of Cabrini Green, a mother evicted because of the zero tolerance and one strike policies that intentionally discriminate against women of African descent. And Martha had been sleeping in her car for four years. And we were tired. People pushed out for public housing with nowhere to go. Having lobbied in D.C. and everywhere, we say, what are we to do? Well, we went back to the textbooks, right? Well, in the Civil Rights Movement, well, it was illegal for blacks and whites to gather together, eat together, talk together, go to school together like this. This was illegal. But that generation did something that they believed to be morally right. They broke the law to change the law. That is the foundation of what we believe. We believe that we, the people, have a responsibility to enforce the human right to housing. In the event that the government don't do it, the banks don't do it, it is the responsibility of the people to institute something for the people. You don't believe me? Check out your Constitution. I got one better for you. There's an article called 25 in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We said that we could not fight this system, this bank, using constitutional law. 
Well, like any good game, we needed something, you know, to get an edge up on our opponent. You know, because since America didn't respect human rights, we were going to use human rights as the basis of reclaiming vacant land for homeless people. And we would simplify it to the world to say, well, you heard of Habitat for Humanity who build houses for people. Well, we are the hood for humanity, right? <laughs> We're doing it for the people from the hood. We said that it was up to the people to lead by example and show this government of what we mean when we say we're going to take homeless people and match them up with people that's housing. If there's 13 home, vacant homes to one homeless person, don't take rocket science or a degree to figure this one out. What it takes is a commitment and some skills. And that's what we tried to do. Martha Biggs was the first takeover. The campaign has only taken over 30 to 40 vacant units that we know of. Although the authorities, the Chicago Police Department, Department of Justice, Housing and Urban Development would say, we influenced almost 500 takeovers in the city of Chicago, thousands across the country. Why is this? Why are we so arrogant to do something like this? We say this work is about women and children, if you look at the logo. This is about our responsibility to leave a world that our children will inherit that is better than ours. This is about taking theory, putting it in your back pocket, and putting it into practice what you believe to be morally right. This is about challenging the banking system, the government system, even the institution, because none of the success of the campaign could ever happen if there was not a collaboration of the community, Dr. Toussaint Lozier coming from the college, and us moving as a collective to change the conditions of our community. Thank you. To continue the story of the Chicago anti-eviction campaign, Ms. Pat Hill. Ooh, um, I can sit all night and listen to these guys, which I have on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. Being the, elder, being the elder of the group, you can still learn from them, especially what you get from the youth is the, is the inspiration, is the vigor. Um, I tend to, since I've reached that age, I tend to try to focus a lot on solution. We spend a lot of time talking about the victimization and the victims. Uh, earlier today, we alluded to the culprit. Uh, I think uh, Professor Harris, when she talked about uh, white supremacy. And we'll talk about that, but we'll kind of skim over it. And to be very specific, we need to talk about white male supremacy. Because white women are not equal to white men. So when we talk about white supremacy, we need to talk about white male supremacy. Not racism. We get that diluted. We give them a break. We have to talk about supremacy. And when you talk about this struggle, we got to deal with motivation and intent. What motivates, what is this about? The motivation is about power. And what's the intent? World domination. I mean, everything is moving in that direction. As Jerry I said, don't take right record science, and maybe at one time it did. But all of the displacement, all of the land grab that's going on around in this country and globally, now we know what they talk about when they say, oh, this is a global situation. It's world domination. The other thing I think we need to really deal with in terms of solutions is what do we do to arrive at combating this, ending it? One of the things is that they're organized around an idea. We're disorganized around a whole bunch of ideas, but we're victimized. Uh, my story kind of like, in terms of the uh, anti-eviction campaign, happened in an unusual way. Many people would consider me, I guess, a system person, which I never have been. But on paper, it looks like that. I was a former public school teacher. I retired from the Chicago Police Department after 21 years. And now I teach adjunct at a, at a uh, public university. On paper, man, she, she goes along with the system. So how did I happen to be a so-called victim of an eviction? Living in a community in Chicago that has been proclaimed as the only community that has been gentrified from black to black. Income levels. I mean, I'm so-called part of the diminishing middle class, the erased middle class, the, the gone middle class. 
and raising children and all of them college educated and you know, all that taking vacations on paper. But let me tell you what happened. I made a decision around 1995 that I wanted to move back into a community that I was raised in as a, as a child in a predominantly uh, um, growing black community, but it was part, I guess you could call it the equivalent to the Harlem Renaissance. I live in a community called Bronzeville. That was the mecca for black entertainment, black artists, black bourgeoisie, black middle class. And so I was able to get a house there. Now I admit the house was built in 1888. The house was in horrible condition, but the feds or the government or the state, whatever you want to call it, was offering money to rehab these communities. So I go into this community making the decision that this is where I want to live the rest of my life and rehab this house and be amongst my people and think about the historical relevance of it and just be happy. Well, the creator has a master plan. And that plan was, and I've always been a movement person. I came out of the 60s movement. I didn't have a choice, that's when I was born. But on paper, they didn't know that. So they decided, first of all, I didn't, let me, let me back up. I didn't notice that strategically in these communities all over the country, that people were losing their homes in some very crazy ways. For example, this thing of, well, the subtlety was eminent domain. That was one of the things. But people were losing their homes over water bills that suddenly went from $50 a month to $300 a month. A lot of elderly people were losing their homes on delinquent taxes. Just all this stuff, but I was, I was kind of immune to that because I didn't, I didn't see that coming. So I purchased a house at the time that was valued at about $30,000. I got it for $34,000. Had to put almost $200,000 in it to make it livable. And so I did. And I was living there comfortably for a few years, and all of a sudden I get a phone call from the mortgage company. And, uh, no, I'm sorry, I get a notice in the mortgage, uh, in the mail about my mortgage going up $500 per month. Not a year, per month. So I knew it had to be an error, so I called the mortgage company and said, hey, look, you know, what's going on to get this thing in the mail? Oh, um, you don't have homeowner's insurance. I mean, that was ridiculous. I mean, like, what does one have to do with the other, which I did. So we get the, uh, the insurance company on the phone, do a three-way. They let them know, yeah, she's always had insurance. Okay, everything's cool. Next month, mortgage bill, same thing. $500 a month more. They said, well, I'll tell you what, you just pay the $500, and when we find out the error, we will reimburse you. Well, as you know, you born at night, but not last night, right? <laughs> so I was not going to do that. And, and what kicks in? What kicks in? The 60s, resistance. Oh, hell to the gnaw. <laughs> They are trying to exploit me. Why? Well, a lot of people offered a lot of different things because of my activism. Uh, I told you I was on the police department, but they fi tried to fire me three times. So I wasn't your typical officer. And it wasn't for killing anybody, it wasn't for stealing, and it wasn't for drugs. It was for challenging the system. And you don't challenge the police department. But I couldn't help myself. You know, devil must have made me do it. <laughs> so real quickly, uh, I sent them the mortgage payment that I normally sent them. They sent the payment back. They says, uh, you are delinquent in these extra fees now because you didn't send the right amount, so on. And this went on for three months. So you know what happens after three months if you don't pay the money that they say that you owe, you are, quote, delinquent. So I call them up and say, hold on. Um, what, what's with this? You know, my home is in trouble now because of you. You never fixed the problem, and you want me to pay this extra money. Well, if you pay $10,000 in the late fees and this and that, and it went on and on, we'll bring you current. Well, I was even more pissed off then than I was the first time. And so now I began to hit his buzz about this organization. Oh, Lord, I got me some young brothers and sisters that's going to change the system right up my alley. I'm getting older. I need somebody to take my place. Uh, let them know what's going on. So we started meeting. I started learning a lot about what they were doing because they were researching a lot. One thing you have to do in this, you got to stay ahead of the game. you got to research. you got to anticipate the next. It's like playing chess. You don't wait for something to happen to react. You got to be proactive. So really, I didn't think anything would happen. 
I really thought we were going to fix that problem. I didn't know that there was a land grab in the community. I didn't know this was going on all over the country. I was focused on fighting the police department. I was focused on some other things, not losing my house. That just never occurred to me, which it probably didn't occur to a lot of people. I was the play. I'm going like, did they take a script? Did they know what happened to me? And uh, I'm talking about what you did earlier tonight. So ultimately, I'm in the bed one Saturday morning, and someone rings the bell. And I look out the window, because being a police officer, you have to see them before they see you. And I see this guy standing at the door with this little name tag on, look like, like he made it up. And I went to the door and I opened it and I said, can I help you? He said, something's happened to this house. And I'm looking around, there's no fire. What, what happened to the house? And he says, uh, this house has been sold. I said, uh, I think you better get off my porch. He says, this house has been sold. That made no sense whatsoever. But what had happened was, as the sentence goes, <laughs> is that at some point in time, the bank made a decision, and they're in collusion with all the institutions, all the courts, what you said in the play, all the courts, all of them are in collusion in this land grab. And it's all about land, people. That's where. The determination is, that's where the value, the power, the wealth is. And uh, they had made a decision that they wanted that house. I mean, by every means necessary. And so I finally got a day in court. And the judge told me, he says, well, we've been here seven times and you've never appeared. And I'm going to get a notice. Well, it was delivered. In Chicago, I don't know if it's this way all over the country, but anybody 13 and over can receive a notice of eviction or court or whatever. 13, they don't have the mental ability to accept it, but they will do that. So now we know that it's rigged. It's rigged. And you never showed up, getting back, you never came, so I've, uh, accept, I've uh, approved the judicial sale. I said, wait, Your Honor, there has to be a mistake, and the bank is standing next to me, their lawyer. And I said, we'll work it out. I mean, this is my optimism. I'm still optimistic. And that was in 2011. Uh, oh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> but to make a long story short, because I can't go through the whole thing, is that on the day that they came to evict me, which I just could not fathom, I get a call from my daughter who stays with me, and she said, Ma, sheriffs are here. And they said, we don't live here anymore. We have to get out. Just imagine that. Just imagine, I think I've been there, well, this year I've been there 20 years, 21 years. But that was like, what, 16, 17 years. I said, they what? And I had begun a new job just for fun, and not to say I don't need the money, it was just for fun, but I rushed home. And literally, in our city, the sheriffs, they knock in your door, but they don't take your furniture. They hire, the bank hires a company to come in and move your furniture. And I'm sta I go to my home, and these strange people are standing there and say, we come to move your furniture. And at that moment, all I knew to do was I had to hold them up and make that phone call to them. <laughs> 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 so they all went into their telephone booths and put on their Superman. <laughs> 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 and I delayed these guys in my house, just small talk, you know, and they're going like, well, we don't want to call the police. I said, call the police. <laughs> After all, they didn't know that I worked that district, and almost every officer in that <laughs> district had been to my house. We had oatmeal and barbecue and whatever, so I went, they weren't going to evict me. We knew that wasn't going to happen, and, and a few minutes later, I started hearing, well, not a few minutes, but a little while later, I started hearing this noise at the front door. Where are they? Who are they? Where are they? We come to get them. And I look up, and I mean gangbusters had come through the door, all right? And it looked like bodies started flying, but it didn't. It was just my imagination, but it looked like bodies started flying. And all I know is they were told to leave by these guys. Before that evening, yes, they deserve it. Tucson. Now, I live in a, quote, middle-class community, but I get along with all my neighbors. I look up, all my neighbors are there supporting me. They didn't say, what the hell is going on? Why are you creating this problem in my community? I'm a good neighbor. I'm a real good neighbor. And we all are. And, and, and so by the time that evening was over, 
because they made phone calls, and this is the absolute truth. I could not believe you couldn't have written it. I would say over 120 people were at my house. They started coming on bicycles and all kinds of ways, the Occupy movement, white people, brown people. And I'm going like, what's going on here? And they stayed for two weeks. I have a large yard. I have a two-story house. They had tents. They had tents. Next thing I knew, friends was bringing toilet paper, tuna salad, everything. They fed them. They kept them. We were going back and forth to court. We uh, did interviews. We were like celebrities of taking over. And, and the police even finally got there. And they didn't know which way. Now, police deal in civil law, not, not I mean, uh, criminal law, not civil law. And I was able to convince them, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do this. So there's another part to the story because I'm still there. <laughs> and I want to pay homage to these people. Two minutes. <laughs> oh, two signs says time up. Questions, I'll answer. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. And now from the great city of Los Angeles, Pete White. Oh. So I'm going to stand up as well. I'm going to try not to have the, uh, the wire hanging over. It's interesting. So first and foremost, can we have a moment of silence for Charlie Kunyang, Brother Africa, um, who was killed by the LAPD not far away from where we sit here this evening, right? And we would argue he was killed in the advance of banishment of an entire community. So I want to give that a couple of seconds. The other thing, because uh, my mother raised me well, I want to shout out a few people in the room. I want to shout out Suzette Shaw, member of LA Can, Charles Porter, <laughs> been doing the work in the front lines a while, Nancy Berlin, Gilda Haas, my new best friend, Kelly Lido Hernandez from <laughs> UCLA. We are best friends, whether you know it or not. <laughs> whether you know it or not. I think I want to, when we think about why I do this work, who and what comes to mind is Asada Shakur, right? When she says, it is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. chains. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains, right? And so I got chills. Each time I say that, I get chills, right? I'm from LA, and from this space I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about the stories of resilience, because oftentimes when others tell our stories, they don't tell you about our resilience, right? They don't tell you about the shoulders we stand on and the traditions of resistance and resilience that we practice. They attempt to erase us as if we are not there, right? I was thinking about um, the conversation. Ananya and Sam came and visited, and Ananya, she was getting it all together. She was like, I think I know what I want you guys to do, but do what you do. And I was like, what does that mean, <laughs> Ananya? I think you know, yeah. I was like, I don't know what that means. But as we talked, right, the ideas around eviction, displacement and banishment came to mind, right? And it was something Patricia said. Oftentimes in America, when you think about eviction, you're thinking about the courts. There's just an issue between the bank and the property owners. There's just a, an issue between the renter and the property owner, right? That's not violent. They can deal with that. And then when you think about displacement, the same thing. Ah, they can go somewhere else, right? There's somewhere else to go, right? But then the idea of banishment, right, that hits us all on a whole nother level, right? Because when we think about banishment, when you hear it, you know it's violent, right? 
When you hear the word banishment, you know you have nowhere to go, right? Now, all three terms, of course, are violent, but this idea of banishment is an idea that sort of settles in my craw right now, particularly when we talk about gentrification. Particularly gentrification, a stone's throw away from where you find yourself. Also thinking about those terms, I have got to say, I have got to introduce Chavez Ravine, right? I'm an Angelino, right? Understanding that Chavez Ravine is not an aberration, that that same sort of white supremacist attitude continues to pervade, right? To grab, to rip apart communities. I've got to think about Manzanar, right? I heard you talk about Bronzeville. After they interned the Japanese from this area, they called this area for five years Brownsville. This is for you. This is, are you, am I, am I on it, <laughs> Kelly? All right, that's, that's a historian who's my best friend, right? And, and when you, if you've read Isabella Wick, uh, Wilkerson's Warmth of Sons, right? This area was an area where African Americans came, right? Fleeing the South and trying to be with their family. So they uproot one community, jail them, and another community comes in for five years, right? As if the first community was not there. My quick story, and Toos, I'm glad you're looking down. What, what, what I got, Toos? <laughs> Five minutes, I got six minutes, because he said give me one sec. <laughs> yep, six. So, <laughs> so, so it's interesting, right? And so, how do you know? How do you know when your community is about to be gentrified, right? How do you know? Right? From, from our vantage point, and, and this is interesting, this gets really interesting, because it's a conversation me and JR had a number of years ago, but this is how you know in Los Angeles that your community is getting gentrified, right? When you're on Main Street between 5th and 6th, and there's no less than five doggy daycare, puss and pooch, this is real, <laughs> right? This is real. When no less than five of these places pop up, but there's no dogs, you know you're in trouble, right? <laughs> right? There's no dogs. How do we have all of these places to put some pooch and all these things? Ken, but there's no dogs, right? When you have cafes called The Nickel, and, and they specialize, and, and it's called The Nickel, and it's written up in LA Times as a, what do they say, a play on the way the area used to be, like a nickel bag, and they sell bacon-wrapped hot uh, uh, donuts, not hot dogs, donuts. You know you're on your way out, right? You know you're on your way out. On an epistemological level, you know none of this is for you, right? None of this is for you, right? When you get a spot called Egg Slut, now, this is real. This is real again. I couldn't make this up. When you get a spot called Egg Slut, this is a, this is a breakfast, right, a diner. And the line is wrapped around to go to, I don't know what they're selling in Egg Slut, but it must be good, because there's folks lined up. You know your community is in trouble, right? When you have a bike shop called On Some Shit, what kind of shit are you on? <laughs> Straight up, come on. You know your community is in trouble, because you know none of this is for you, right? You know none of this is for you. And so we fought against gentrification. We fought against banishment in downtown Los Angeles, a five-year campaign, right? Because we understood from the get-go that this was a battle for the land. And we understood historically that if they ever moved us from the land, we would never go back, right? And so our vision was we need to do whatever we can by any means necessary to stay on the land, right? We fought a five-year campaign, right? And so Hollywood, Hollywood would have the civil rights movement happening in two years, right? They don't tell you, started way back in the 30s, but they would have you believe it was two years. And so this campaign was a five-year campaign, right? And it resulted in 
the residential hotel ordinance, right? Which protected 13, 13 to 15,000 units across the city of Los Angeles. Then um, Housing Department Director Mercedes Marquez said, this is the strongest tenant rights um, policy ordinance legislation that has ever been created in the city of LA, right? Because we knew, and just quickly what it did, it ensured that if they removed any units from our community, right, if they wanted to create 20 more egg sluts, if they wanted to create a boutique hotel, right, they could do that, but any units of housing that were there would have to be replaced in the community up front, right? I'm going to say that again, and y'all should clap, <laughs> because that, does, that, that don't happen that often, right? It does not happen that often. And folks clapped and celebrated, and we thought it was over. We thought we were there to stay, right? And within two weeks, the Safer Cities Initiative was launched in Skid Row. And this is, this is where that whole Chavez Ravine, um, Skid Row thing sort of marries one another, right? Because when they were talking about they didn't never say gentrification, the redevelopment of downtown, right? That's what they said. Um, what they attempted to suggest is that real people didn't live there, right? They had a redevelopment plan that called for the removal of thousands of units as if we didn't live there, right? And one of our strategies, just in terms of an optic strategy over this five years, was to go before the city council and others and say, my name is XYZ, I am a resident, I have been here forever, right, to make them not remove us. The Safer Cities Initiative came, 2006. 116 police officers deployed in a 50 square block area and a population of 13 to 15,000 mostly African-Americans, and focused on a 20-block area. In the first three years, there were 36,000 quality of life citations given. Quality of life tickets, right? Simple ticket. Smoking a cigarette, thumping the ash, was a littering ticket, which got you handcuffs, which got, which got you four or five officers around you, right? Humiliating you. There were 27,000 arrests, right? 27,000 in the first three years in a community of 13 to 15,000, right? And this was banishment at its finest, right? The police department and the courts, right, were in bed with the developers, and they were attempting to do all they could to ensure people never came back. But we fought, right? And we're still there. And it's worth, it's worth a clap. And it's funny, JR and I, we were together in Chicago a number of years ago, and there was a question, and I'm going to be done. I got you. Look at you. I got you. I got you. <laughs> so we were, we, were, we were in Chicago, and I think it was during the, it was during the United Nations tour, because I know for you and I, it's either hip hop, hell raising, or the right to housing. And, and I said, JR, I was like, the buildings are gone, but where are all the people? I was like, the buildings are gone, and where are all the people? And JR looked at me, he was like, Shh, I don't know, right? I think they're over here, or I think they're over there. And it was at that moment, that was about six years ago, I was like, yeah, this ain't about eviction, this is about banishment. We don't even know where our people are going. Thank you for allowing me to share. <laughs>